मांडुक्य कारिका प्रणाम मंत्र ओम भद्रम करणे भी शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्ये माक्ष भीर्य जत्रा सिरंग सुष्टुवागुंसस्तनु विषेम देव हित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्ववेदा स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्ट नेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दधा ओम शांति 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 हरि ओम so welcome to the last section of manduki karika it has been long series of talks <clears throat> just that this chapter is pretty long around 100 verses name of this chapter section is alat shanti alat means fire brand for example if you take some flame <clears throat> some kind of flame maybe uh, a burning stick or whatever and move it around very fast so that fire will appear like a circle of fire like our eyes cannot process fast data for example uh, those of you know about movie cinema they need to have certain number of frames and if those frames are moved at a particular speed the eyes cannot distinguish that these are different frames they appear to us like a movie cinema and that's why if you see those pictures maybe on the reel that we used to have in earlier times or uh, even if the movie clips that you send uh, through electronic media whatsapp etc you see that they are just pictures and when they move at a particular speed they give the appearance of something moving i remember when as a kid uh, i saw the picture of that in some textbook it was such a great disappointment to me because i had seen one movie and i was so impressed that was way back in early 60s going to a movie hall and watching a cinema was a big thing for us and when in the textbook i saw a picture of a reel and how the pictures are slightly different from the previous frame <clears throat> it was such a great disappointment not that i stopped watching movies but uh, it was a great disappointment that exactly this world is place for great disappointments you are watching frames but those frames appear like a movie there is one single flame from frame now it's l flame it's moving so fast that it gives you the appearance of fire brand so alat shanti means quenching of that fire brand and there is words to follow as kids you might have played moving in circle quickly and then you feel that this houses and trees and everything they are moving around you but you knew very well that those are fixed those are static we see this world moving but is this world really moving because if this world is really moving then this world must have a reality of its own an existence of its own 
and we do have philosophy both in the east and the west who who take this world to be real prakriti to be real but vedanta doesn't accept that so for us the world is fixed the mind is moving and it gives you the appearance of the world moving but vedanta goes one step further says nothing comes nothing goes nothing moves neither the mind is moving nor the world is moving nothing is moving you are just imagining those things imagining where there is only pure consciousness there is only brahman nothing is there is nothing else it's pure brahman pure consciousness and there you are just imagining things Mandukya Upanishad and Karika is the twin, or rather you can say, the Upanishad and its explanation is aimed at removing that hypnotism. And as you might remember, the first chapter was Agam Prakaran, where the idea was introduced and uh, scriptural statements were used to prove that idea. and then came vaitatya prakaran where it was shown how what appears as real is in fact false you know those things we have already discussed we cannot go into it again the third one which we were doing till the previous talk was advait prakaran now in advait prakaran lots of arguments were used this kind of argument that kind of argument the most important of that and uh, dear listeners and serious listeners i would like you to remember this that the most important argument that was used by mandukya karika to contradict various philosophies was that these philosophies are fighting with each other you may not agree with uh, this argument but for advait this is very important why advait says we have no fight with anyone if your mother has quite a few kids four five kids may be fighting amongst themselves but for mom they are all her kids advait vedant doesn't fight with anybody it has place for everybody it accepts every everyone everything every philosophy the problem lies with the dualists and what advait says is that look since you are fighting amongst yourselves that shows that you all are wrong you might say that the same argument can be applied to advait also but no advait says that no this argument cannot be applied to us because something like a person who is intoxicated standing on the road and challenges a person who is on an elephant that come come you come forward and i am also taking my elephant forward so what would that person say he'll just laugh and move on the idea is even if you come challenging advait advait will not even respond because he knows that what you are telling is correct actually see um if you can understand just two very simple things one is pure consciousness which is infinite unborn and there is this world world means mind when you are looking at that pure consciousness through the mind it's like seeing something through a lens through colored glass what you are seeing seeing is not wrong the only thing is it is not giving you a complete picture actually this statement is extremely simple but use usually profound 
when you are looking out the window uh, say looking at the mountain you cannot have a clear picture but the picture that you are seeing is not wrong then you move to the next window from there you see the mountain it will give you a picture it will give you a view but that view will not be complete come out of the house and you get a completely different view advait is like removing every possible glasses that you might have personally the ideas became clear to me only when i understood this concept this mind and consciousness thing till you are in the realm of mind everything appears correct because it's your mind you are trying to see the truth based on your mind and there are many stories even sri ram krishna told certain stories to convey the idea once you get out of it the picture becomes different not only that it also becomes clear why those people have different ideas and why those people are fighting with each other you might smell bit of arrogance in the statement well everyone is arrogant even madhvacharya madhvacharya propounded dvaita you can smell arrogance from a distance same with ramanuja and when these allegations are made against shankaracharya well naturally the joy of understanding something for example if you remember your school days i mean you were learning something new and suddenly it became clear to you the subject matter the idea that was being discussed you suddenly feel so happy believe me believe me there is no happiness greater than the happiness of understanding a subject if you can grasp an idea and more importantly if you can come up with a new idea there can be no joy nothing all these things of gaining wealth and having married life etc they pale into nothingness when you compare your joy with understanding something so naturally these masters and uh, when it comes to the masters of dvaita and vishishta dvaita they are the greatest i mean we can never aspire to reach that level it's a fact but when we are discussing a subject we are discussing a subject so the most important argument that advait uses against them is they are mutual contradictions everyone is contradicting everyone else that shows that all of them are wrong advait doesn't contradict anybody and more importantly that our godpad says in manduke karika that your arguments are based on rag and dwesh attachment and aversion that means mind is involved if mind is involved in something how can i trust you moving away from the subject those of you who might be interested in west philosophy you know that there were great philosophers there are greek philosophers there was aristotle there was plato and then there was dark ages in the europe and then many more philosophers came there were the idealists realists there was spinoza there was kant there was hegel but can you trust them no you can't why you know whatever they are telling they are telling by the power of their mind mind is always impelled by the twin forces of attachment and aversion 
you can't trust them what what about indian philosophy indian philosophy is actually not really a philosophy the way western philosophy is because here we don't apply our mind here we apply our mind only to understand what these sages have explained about the truth beyond the mind so we don't question the ved the vedas are not questioned the upanishads are not questioned these are not philosophy like if somebody who is writing a book on indian philosophy and they talk about the philosophy of the vedas and philosophy of the upanishads that is uh, wrong shri ram krishna did not have any philosophy how can he have philosophy he was just speaking out the truth how can you have a philosophy from you can interpret the words of shri ram krishna which will become a philosophy then it will be your philosophy because you are looking at that ultimate truth through your mind it's a very important point for those who are interested in understanding the comparative philosophy now western philosophy is a complete work of mind indian philosophy is not that indian philosophy assumes the truth truth as given in the vedas and the upanishads the acharyas the great teachers the great sages they are just trying to make sense out of it because you can't trust your senses completely nor can you trust your mind completely there is a joke about i won't name the lawyer there is a beautiful joke about a lawyer in india it's a real story a very famous lawyer considered to be the greatest lawyer that india has ever produced and once he proved about constitution that that something was to be accepted this is the truth and supreme court judges accepted that after few years it so happened that that great lawyer he had to oppose that and he opposed that then the judge supreme court judge is asked mr so and so some years ago you said this is the truth and now you are telling that that is not the truth what is your stand and this gentleman simply said i have evolved sir well lawyers talk like that i have evolved but what do you mean to say that when i argue a case i argue it if you take that statement i have evolved sir uh, your lordship can you really trust such minds even take the case of scientists those of you who have studied botany and those of you who have studied geology those of you who know something about blood circulation the body you know what childish ideas they had and they kept on evolving why because well, their mind was evolving their understanding was evolving in astronomy if everywhere ideas has been evolving because certain facts have emerged certain facts have come to light certain facts you have grasped and you have built new theories and based on that you have seen how new things can be predicted etc but that does not happen when you transcend your mind those of you who have been into spirituality those of you who have studied the upanishads for example if you study the upanishads you will see that all the upanishads although they belong to different uh, families they tell the same thing shri ramakrishna who stands as the ultimate authority of all the spiritual truths that india has ever discovered he says everything is true so what should be the ultimate philosophy of the vedas and the upanishads or what is the ultimate philosophy of india advait and by advait we mean vedanta because 
Vedant is a better word compared to Advaita to understand the idea. Sometimes people think that Advaita means only that oneness. No. Advaita takes dualism, that is Dvaita, Vishishta Dvaita, Shuddha Dvaita, all the Dvaita within it. That's why Swami Vivekananda often used the word Vedanta for that. But actually it is Advaita Vedanta only, as we are saying in this commentary. I hope I am not boring you, but it is very important to understand this section. Now, when this, this fourth, first was Agam Prakaran, scriptures. Second was Vaitatya, falsehood. Third was Advaita. And now begins Alat Shanti, quenching of the firebrand. It will only be advancing the arguments that have been used earlier. So, things will become pretty easy for us. Those of you who have listened to our earlier talks and have tried to understand, have grasped something, you'll find things to be easier. Now, when it is presenting the arguments, the moment we talk about arguments, it is some kind of inference. To remind you, there are different kinds of methods of knowledge. First one is known as direct knowledge that we get through our senses. And the second one is inference. Inference is the logical outcome of something. Now when it comes to inferences, they say there are two kinds of inferences. First is very common deductive, where one thing leads to the other. But the second thing which is popularly known as inductive, here they talk, they have a different term which is, says that a vyati reki, vyati reki, it's practically inductive, but it takes a different approach. And it says that when you see the absence of one, if you see the absence of one, it proves the other. Those of you who have some idea about mathematics, in mathematics, there is a very important tool for proving something, which is known as theory of negation. You want to prove something, you don't prove it. You prove that the opposite of it is not possible. When you prove that the opposite of it is not possible, then automatically it's proved that opposite of this opposite is possible. I mean, these are arguments and... Uh, our Nyaya philosophy in India and the Western philosophy, where there is logic, they took it to great heights. Here, here they will be mostly using the second one. Absence of one proves the presence of the other. So, just said that, once we have made this clear, we can... You can see what Acharya has to say. He begins with the same thing that whatever we discussed, first chapter was about this, second was about this. And then he says, here we begin the chapter with the first verse where humble offerings are offered, uh, humble offerings are made to the Sampradaya Karta. We believe that whatever knowledge we are discussing is not coming from us. There is a strong tradition and the tradition has to go back to God. India doesn't trust any knowledge that comes from the head of a person. In this case, it is Narayan himself, Narayan, who stays in Badrikashram. Those of you who have been to the Himalayas might be knowing about the four important places in the northern Himalayas, up Haridwar, Gangotri, Jamunotri, Kedarnath, Badrinath. Badrinath is also known as Badrikashram. Uh, Badrikashram is famous since our epic ages. In Mahabharata also we come across Badrikashram. He said that 
God took up two forms, Nar and Narayana, the human and the divine. And they performed tapasya for a very long time, both Nar and Narayan. So Badrikashram is famous for the place where God himself performed tapasya. God maintains this universe by the power of tapas, Badrikashram. If you go to Badrikashram, I have not been, I have not been to Badrikashram. So you will find that this statue of Narayan, people go to make pranams and it's a pilgrimage, it's a religious tourism. But they forget the idea that that's the place where Narayan did tapasya. It is believed that Vyasadev Vyasadev went and lived in Badrikashram and still lives there. And Shankaracharya went to Badrikashram. Shankaracharya Shankaracharya was a great devotee of Narayan, although he was teacher of Advaita. And Shankaracharya's teacher's teacher, Gaudapada, who has given this karika. In the last chapter, in the concluding chapter, he begins with prayer to Narayan, where he says, Jnane na akash kalpe na dharmanyo gagano opaman geya abhinne na sambuddhastam vande dui padam varam. It's a very nice mantra, very nice shlok. Translated into English, it reads, I bow to the best among men who, by means of knowledge, which is like Akash, knowledge is compared to Akash, and which is non different from the goal of knowledge. We will explain all, each of these words. Realize the nature of the jivas, dharma, which too are like Akash. English translation is, I bow to the best among men. The term is actually Purushottama. Purushottam should not be translated as best among men. Purushottam means God. And here, bowing down is before Badri Narayan. Narayan, who stays at Badrikashram. Knowledge of Advaita has come from there, from Narayan to Vyasa, and from there, through a strong tradition of guru and disciple, it has come down to Shankaracharya, and now we are having this discussion. Since to whom the last term is Dvi Padam Varam, Dvi Padam Varam. Actually, Dvipada Vara means the explanation is Dvipadang Vara. One who has two, two legs. Two legs is not really, no, actually, two statements, Pada. Two words, you can say. Nar and Narayan. Because of Nar and Narayan, God is being addressed as Dvi Padangvara. Whenever Narayan is uh, prayed to, Nar Narayan, Nar is assumed there. And uh, in our Ramakrishna mission tradition, Sri Ramakrishna is Narayan, Swami Vivekananda is Nar, Nar Narayan. Nar is also a sage. Nar normally means human being, but Nar is a sage. So Gaurapath bows down before God, who is being addressed here as Dvi Padam Varam. Dvi Pada Upalakshit, one who is known by twin terms, Nar and Narayan. And why? It says, 
by means of his knowledge. God alone knows. And from there the sages who maintain this tradition, they know. Which knowledge? Knowledge of this world, which is like Akash. Now this is very interesting. Tell me.